So Parkinson's disease, a progressive neurodegenerative disorder affecting movement, muscle, and speech. Once again, gradual loss of nerve cells. In this case, nerve cells that contain dopamine. They're located in the substantia nigra, where movement control is essential. So let's look at the pathogenesis here. We're not talking about beta amyloid anymore and Dow protein phosphorylation. We're talking about dopamine transfer, dopamine manufacture, dopamine reception, breakdown in the substantia nigra. So <clears throat> in the reduction of dopamine, we lose information transfer, we lose motor control, issues around immune function, hypothalamic releasing factors get disrupted, testosterone gets affected, and dopamine transporting neurons commit suicide at higher than normal rates. So kind of like we're talking about apoptosis, we get higher rate of death and turnover among these dopaminergic neurons. Our acetylcholine receptor network is also affected, and this is a lot of the dopamine treatments we have now moder in the modern medicine world, you know, levodopa, which is basically Cinemet, right, which we're going to talk about, that drug doesn't help with acetylcholine at all. But that's also a problem in this disease. So there's the substantia nigra right there, those nigrostriatal fibers, major oxidative stress and mitochondrial damage in the pars compacta of the substantia nigra. Back to oxidative damage, right? Mitochondrial dysfunction. So we talked about dopamine earlier. Um, it's a big motivator, regulates motor control, sexual drive, information transfer. And as we age, testosterone release gets inhibited if we don't have enough dopamine. So imagine the importance of that exercise to build testosterone, to influence dopamine, to have a feedback relationship where dopamine can support testosterone, help us rebuild those nerves. Body has to build dopamine, which requires a lot of different pieces, and it's a slow process. We build the dopamine up, and then we store it in the vesicles, in the synapses, and actually in the, in the neurons. We hold it there, and that's a slow process. If we thought about that essence analogy again, like we have to store some of our essence and this form of dopamine so we can use it to conduct the life experience. So tyrosine, <clears throat> we've mentioned a few times here, it's a precursor to the catecholamines, like I said, norepinephrine, epinephrine, to thyroid hormone, and also to L-DOPA. And L-DOPA is the precursor to dopamine. We build tyrosine into L-DOPA, we build L-DOPA into dopamine. And so, Tyrosine is an obvious thought for a solution, right? Well, let's give people tyrosine. The problem is, is that it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's not that simple because the conversions have many different issues, many factors, many co-activating processes that are involved. And when you're looking at tyrosine and combining it with dopamine, you can get an on-off syndrome where if you're giving tyrosine, People get like a flood of dopamine and then a deficiency of dopamine, a flood of dopamine and, and a deficiency, and then it just on-off is really hard for Parkinson's patients. You want on, on, on all the time so that you're stable. Because when you get in those off periods, loss of motor control, twitches, ticks, loss of balance, tremors. So <clears throat> I just want to mention a little bit about tyrosine. And we'll look here at kind of, the synapse in the dopamine region, right? There's tyrosine becoming L-DOPA through that tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme. Then you've got that second step there, which is the DOPA decarboxylase, which decarboxylates L-DOPA to make dopamine. And I like this diagram because if you look around on here, it's, it's really confusing. There's a lot of going on. But if you look over on the side, um, kind of down in this corner over here, the COMT, catecholamine omethyltransferase, and then this MAO, monoamine oxidase, these are enzymes that are going to break down the dopamine and get rid of it. They're going to degrade it. So this is a target for drugs, right? Let's stop those enzymes from breaking down the dopamine. That'll make more dopamine available, right? Well, this is also a place we want to work. Let's give people dopamine because dopamine is the stuff that works. So we're going to see how these different drugs <clears throat> that affect these different areas either work or don't work, and then how we can affect this area, these areas with plants and nutrients. So I gave you a similar slide with Alzheimer's disease, very similar pieces of the puzzle. I'm just going to let you guys take a look at it. You've got genetics, homocysteine, dopamine, levels being low, 
deficiency of androgens, endocrine hormones, too much animal food, low, low cholesterol, reproductive hormone imbalances. Oxidative damage has been strongly indicated in Parkinson's disease. Big thing here, again, reactive oxygen species and antioxidant, breakdown of cellular metabolism and detoxification networks. Same kind of stuff. Same things we saw in Alzheimer's, neuronal damage due to oxidation getting out of control. So I want to go back to Chinese medicine here because in Chinese medicine, Parkinson's disease is always associated with something called liver wind. The tree here represents the liver and it's a wood element. And <clears throat> liver wind is produced by the body. It's an endogenous product, this pathological factor called wind that's generated when there's not enough blood in the liver, when the blood is deficient, when there's not enough yin in the body, as we would call it in Chinese medicine, deficiencies of key substances associated with that essence concept lead to the development of this wind in the body. And wind is just like it would be. You know how wind is irritating to people? It's like some people are just like, oh, I just don't like wind. It just makes me feel unsettled. It just kind of disturbs everything. That's what it does in the body. It causes twitches and ticks, muscle spasms. And that's what Parkinson's is in Chinese medicine, and there's a lot to it. So I threw up here just some of, the, some of the patterns associated. It's mostly deficiency, and that's what we're seeing in Parkinson's disease is deficient people, people whose stare is empty, people who are, not, are in a very catabolic state. They're often pale. They're listless. Their faces are just sort of stone. Their voices are low. They're not impassioned anymore. It's deficiency everywhere. That's what's happening in all these syndromes here. There's this one here in the middle, phlegm, fire, obstructing the fluids and channels so fluids and bloods can't nourish them. This is a little bit more of an excess condition where there's some phlegm heat type of stuff, which could be associated with microbes and other things, but disrupt, disrupting the free flow of the bloods, the blood and the other nourishing substances so they can't get to the tissues. So what does TCM say to do? Nourish. Work less. Don't get exhausted. Don't get emotionally overwhelmed. What are the big ones, right? Lose a child. You lose a family member, like a mother or father. You have a, a divorce. These are the big emotional turmoils that, man, that, that acute stress on the body is so intense and the results are so debilitating. Abstain from excessive sexual activity. Don't overdo it. Essence is contained in our reproductive organs. For men especially, in the sperm and the semen, if, that, if you're just releasing it all the time, you never have time to rebuild it, you're depleting your essence. Practice meditation, calming techniques, exercise, and eat broths, medicinal soups, and stews. Keep yourself healthy, keep that digestive system working, nourish that midbrain, right, that mesenteric brain. It's all there. Catabolism. Addressing dopamine as a sole target is a huge oversight and will never produce the results patients are looking for. We are seeing that so strongly. We've got to address the underlying factors. Anabolic and botanical compounds. Testosterone, so important, you guys, so important here. Improve motor symptoms with testosterone, enhance well-being, support re recovery process. And again, not giving testosterone. You can give some in some cases, but combine it with plants and nutrients and only use it if necessary. With exogenous testosterone or DHEA in Parkinson's, no significant benefits have been shown. We need more. We need to do more than just give them testosterone and dopamine. Statin drugs, CoQ10. You gotta be careful with statins, right? Because they block CoQ10 in the body. It's one of the things they do. They lead to myopathies, cardiomyopathies especially. You use statin drugs to prevent heart disease and yet you're causing a deficiency that's one of the main you know, underlying functions of the heart is to produce muscle action that depends on ATP that needs CoQ10 as a cofactor. So you get mitochondrial deficiency from statin drugs. And also, if you lower cholesterol, you end up with low hormone reserve. What do I mean? I mean that cholesterol is the backbone for testosterone, for estrogen, progesterone, pregnenolone, DHEA, androstenediol. You know, they're all built off of cholesterol. So, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, my cholesterol is at 140. I'm doing great. No, you're not. That's not okay. That's not good, especially when you're older. We need more when we get older. 
Why do you think we have a little bit more testosterone cholesterol when we get older? Because we're not as good at making our hormones out of it. We're, we're less efficient, so we need more substrate to start with. Less common in women. Estrogen appears to play a protective role, so we think that that's connected. Women who have had fewer children are more likely to have Parkinson's. And women who go through menopause with a really rough time, really heavy duty, hot flashes, night sweats, it's associated with estrogen imbalances, deficiencies in metabolic you know, pathway dis disruptions. So in those women, using our plants, our medicines to help them get through that menopausal period by supporting their hormones and their actions in the body, we're gonna actually help them prevent the outcome of getting Parkinson's disease. Another reason why people go, oh, it's fine, menopause is fine, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it. I, I just, that's how it is, hot flashes, nice sweats, I just, I'm okay. No, it's not okay. Those are signs and symptoms that your body's screaming. It's not okay. Menopause shouldn't be hell. I know, I'm a man, sorry. Okay, so <laughs> pharmaceutical interventions for Parkinson's. What do we have? Levodopa, carbidopa. That's basically dopamine. That's L-dopa. And then carbidopa we'll talk about. Agonists to the dopamine receptors. Ropinarol, primipexerol, and rotigotine. And then amantadine, which a specific drug that kind of increases dopamine capacity in the neurons, but that it's really just not really in favor. Acetylcholine and dopamine restoratives, that's an interesting name for them. Cogentin and artane, which actually have shown to harm memory and thinking. Those are here you have the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, right? Those things that stop the breakdown of the dopamine in the, in the synapse. Selegiline and resagiline. And then you have the COMT inhibitors, tolcapone and entacapone. Those are both, I, I pointed at those on that diagram, right? These are drugs that target either the, the affinity of the neurotransmitter for the receptors, enhance that efficiency, or they stop the, the dopamine from being broken down. Or they give your body the L-dopa to have plenty of substrate to make dopamine. So levodopa is the gold standard. What happens to most people, though, is after a period of time, Motor fluctuation and dyskinesia increases after some years, and people need to take more and more of it. And in some people, we see accelerated neurodegeneration. It's an amazing thing to be a Parkinson's patient and get on levodopa and have your symptoms go away. It's really amazing. I've watched it many times. But when you're only looking at five to seven years before neurodegeneration and a loss of efficacy, and you need more and more of the drug, and you're only 65 years old, that's just not a solution, guys. That's not the answer. I don't want just five to seven years if I'm 65. I want 30 years, right? So how do we do that? Well, we need to find ways to help dopamine work better. We need to help the body do all the things that we see it's not doing well. And I'm going to tell you, there's, 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 a, there's one plant out there, and you probably know about it, called Mucuna pereans, and we're going to talk about it because it's done amazing things for me and my patients, and I'm going to give you a whole protocol on how to use it. So le levodopa resistance is just, you know, we just don't respond as well to this thing over time. We keep giving more and more dopamine, but there's a cost at doing that. And the neurodegeneration that occurs, there's this breakdown under more and more dopamine that doesn't lead to success for us. We will actually want to enhance efficiency, not just keep adding the substrate. We want to help the body make it. So carbidopa is given with levodopa. Levodopa is L-dopa, that precursor to dopamine. Carbidopa is given with it to inhibit this enzyme, dopa decarboxylase. And it works really well because carbidopa, that drug, stops the, the L-dopa in your bloodstream from becoming dopamine. That's awesome in the body because if you keep giving people more L-dopa, it'll convert to dopamine in their extremities and they'll start having oh, total dyskinesias and shaking and they'll be out of control. Too much dopamine out here is the same side effects or the same effects you'd expect to see with somebody who has Parkinson's disease. So if you, if you just give people high doses of L-dopa, you will cause Parkinsonism in them. So we had to figure out a solution to that. So what was created was this dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. And what it does is it stops L-dopa from becoming dopamine in the body, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So 
L-dopa does cross the blood-brain barrier. So all the L-dopa that gets into your brain gets acted on by this enzyme, dopamine decarboxylase, and becomes dopamine. So in your brain, your substantia nigra gets all this dopamine. But out in your periphery, it's chill. You're not getting crazy side effects. When we first had this therapy of L-dopa, people could take a, they'd feel really good with a low dose, but as soon as you got a little bit more, it just started making your effect worse. Really cool concept, but here's the problem. One of many problems is that the dopa decarboxylase enzyme also is the enzyme that converts tryptophan, I'm sorry, 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, into serotonin. So these people with Parkinson's disease are already coming to you, they're depressed. They're totally deficient. They're just listless. And now you're going to take away their serotonin. We've got to fix that problem. So Cinemet is the, com the combination of levodopa and carbidopa. <sighs> Rapid clearance. You've got to keep taking it every few hours. There are sustained release or controlled release formulations now. Levodopa unfortunately increases homocysteine levels. We saw how bad that was. You can use the level, the, the, the methyl donors. Levodopa requires B6 for metabolism, so it's good to give people a little bit of B6, but you can't give them too much, because if you give them too much, it can actually have some odd effects. Probably up to 35 milligrams of P5, P, something like that, up to 50 or 100 milligrams of, of uh, B6, pyridoxine. Levodopa and tryptophan, Tryptophan, you know, you think, well, if, if, if there's a problem with that enzyme converting from 5-HTP into serotonin, well, if we give people more tryptophan, it'll, you know, go down the course and become 5-HTP and become serotonin, right? Well, we're blocking that enzyme, unfortunately, so it's hard to get it through. But if you space it out and you give people tryptophan, not in combination with carbidopa, you can give them some support. But the evidence hasn't really been very good on this. And I put this up here because a lot of papers will cite serotonin syndrome. And it's a really big like buzzword and it's a fear word around SSRIs and hypericum, you know, St. John's wort, serotonin syndrome, people are gonna get, you know, they're gonna get out of control. And uh, sure, it happens in a very rare case, but if you do it really cautiously, methodically, you bring in doses of things, you can combine them in ways where you're not gonna have this problem. I've never had a patient induce this in all the patients I've helped get off of SSRIs or treat their, their, their um, depression with tryptophan. SAMe, we saw that, how it plays into this. Haven't really seen many effects from it. Sometimes SAMe can give you a PD-like effect, so I don't use SAMe in my patients with Parkinson's. It probably will work in some patients, but you gotta do that trial and error, and I've got such good things going, I don't need it. So here we go, now we're into treatments. The rest of the time is gonna be therapies. So this is Mucuna pereans, the richest natural source of L-dopa in the world. Enhances growth hormone in the body and testosterone. There's also serotonin in the pod, in the leaf and the fruit. It's a free radical scavenger, it has redox capacity. Inhibits cataracts, lowers cholesterol, and slows neurological diseases, especially Parkinson's disease. I'm going to use this study because it came out in 2017. It was actually passed on to me by a neurologist in a nearby city. 18 patients with advanced Parkinson's disease were given one of these protocols, right? 3.5 milligrams per kilogram of levodopa. That's the cinemet we're talking about, not just the levodopa. With the DDCI, that's the dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. That's the carbidopa. So patients were, these, these first group was given basically the standard treatment. The next group was given high-dose mucuna, just mucuna. Then this group was given what they called low-dose mucuna. This group was given just a levodopa without the decarboxylase inhibitor. And this group was given mucuna plus the decarboxylase inhibitor. And then there was a group that was given a placebo. So this study is really nice to have because there hasn't been anything that was this clear. There's been a lot of research into mucuna. Um, there's a lot of studies, you know, in 30 milligrams a day of, or, or sorry, 30 grams a day of mucuna extract reducing uh, symptoms, but there's never been a controlled study like this where it was compared with other drugs and other treatments. 
And the results here were that single dose intake, and, and the, the, uh, mind you that the, the backdrop for this study and how this got sort of popularity and traction was that, hey, in low income countries where people don't have access to pharmaceutical medications, how do we provide something for patients to, to manage their symptoms? And they said, okay, well, let's try this low cost intervention that can be grown in a lot of these countries that would be you know, developing. Let's try mucuna. And, that, and these guys obviously had a lot of knowledge. And so they took mucuna beans, they roasted them, and then they powdered them. It has a mucuna content of about, uh, uh, sorry, an L-dopa content of about 4.5 to 6% L-dopa. This, in this study, it was 5.7%. They used the whole powder. They used the Bolivian black macuna seed. That's how they prepared it. Here's the results. The high dose, so here's what we have. What's going on is the change at 90 minutes is in this lighter color, and the change at 180 minutes, sorry, 180 minutes is a lighter color, and 90 minutes is a darker color. Here's the levodopa, the standard treatment. Here's the high dose macuna. This is the change in their symptoms. Here's the low-dose mucuna. Here's the straight levodopa without the, the, carb, the uh, decarboxylase inhibitor. And here's just mucuna with the decarboxylase inhibitor. And so the decarboxylase inhibitor, what it does is it slows down the time to onset, changes kind of, and, and it changes the length of time that the drug works. We know that. So in both of these, that's, the DDCI just changes that length of time. Look at these statistics, though. The people who took the mucuna and the high dose had results that came on faster. They had results that lasted longer compared to the people that did the levodopa therapy. Interestingly enough, they didn't get those dyskinesias that you would expect if you just gave someone a lot of L-dopa. Remember I just described, if you give someone a lot of L-dopa, it all breaks down to dopamine and it turns into dyskinesias in their body. When they took the L-dopa in mucuna at 5.7%, there was no dyskinesias. They were able to convert that L-dopa into dopamine in their neurons and use it without the decarboxylase inhibitor needed. That's what's so fascinating about this plant, that there is a matrix of compounds in mucuna that actually do the whole job, that help this syndrome, this disease symptom. And some of the studies are pointing to this theory that I have, which is that treating people with mucuna in this matrix of the plant compound will not have a degeneration of their neurons, as we see with long-term levodopa treatment. So I have been making it one of my life goals to really understand how this all works and be able to provide it for patients. And I have about half a dozen people right now, all men, all doing really well on mucuna and nutrients and plants. And the other pieces are important, especially when people come in and they've been on drugs for a long period of time. There's a challenge about getting people off of their drugs. If they, they're like, I don't want to be on these drugs because I know that I'm needing more and it's not working long term. How do I do that? And that's what I've been working on. So I'm going to present to you guys so just a, a patient study that I put in here. Mukuna becomes a big piece of this. You still got to do the big stuff, the bowels, the sleep, and the mood. Address those. Address the root deficiencies. These people are always, and they're always catabolic. They need anabolic support. So you've got to get them on that anabolic support. And I'm going to hit those herbs in just a minute here. Inhibit the PD. That's the mukuna directly. Address the branch. That's treat the dyskinesia of the tremor of the balance. And there's some plants that you can bring in specifically that will help to reduce spasticity, and we'll hit those as well. So Tom, 74-year-old male, came to me about three and a half, maybe four years ago now. Parkinson's, Lyme, PTSD, depression, mycotoxin, hypotension. Vietnam vet, lived alone. Chief complaints, tremor, constipation, depression, fatigue, and declining cognitive function. And, you know, his... Parkinson's was, is, is, you know, he's shaking like this most of the time, you know, when he first came to me, and he was taking levodopa. He was taking levodopa and carbidopa in, as a cinnamon. What I did with Tom is I got him onto mucuna. 
And over the course of about two years, we got him completely off of levodopa and onto only mucuna. And unfortunately, in the beginning of that time, I was still using 40% L-dopa concentrated mucuna, which is available. And people are really into the fact that, hey, if this plant has a lot of L-dopa and L-dopa works great, let's just give people L-dopa. I just somehow got into that and start, thought that that would be good as a way to transition. But I've realized since that that's not good. What is good is the low L-dopa content in the whole plant matrix of mucuna, higher doses, lower L-dopa, more of the other stuff that makes it work. So you have to have people take higher doses because they need to take a lot of the material. But, you know, it's, it's not terrible tasting. It's like Nescafe in India. That's kind of where it started. And, you know, you can have people put it in capsules. On Tom's dose right now, this is where he is today. It's a 15% L-dopa which again is not my favorite, but I haven't found a source of you know, really good quality beans and I haven't got the space to roast them and grind them and give them to all my patients. So I have a 15% extract that's got most of the whole plant there and it seems to be working really quite well. And since he was originally on levodopa and carbidopa, he's down to what he's calling an eighth of a tab, just a tiny little bit of carbidopa on three of his doses per day. And he's taking eight caps, about 500 milligrams each. So about four grams of mucuna here, four here, four here, four here. 16 grams of mucuna. He's just under 20 grams of mucuna a day. With very little carbidopa. And I would like to get the source of that 5.7% material so we can get him off of the carbidopa altogether. Yeah, so, question. Uh, No. 15 or 5? I have a really good source of 15. I want to go to 5. I want to go to what they use in the study. So here's his smoothie that I've got for him, just addressing the other things. And this, of course, would have kind of applied to the Alzheimer's stuff as well. A little protein powder, something like an immunonutrition, you know, some glutamine, some creatine, magnesium. Whey protein, somebody said, you know, we're talking about cysteine earlier, right? Whey protein is the best natural source of cysteine on the planet. Yeah. Yes. Glutamine can convert into glutamate. Yeah. Yeah, glutamine is one of those things where, again, there was a, there was a movement to high dose glutamine start getting into 10, 20 supraphysiological doses, and that can be problematic. It can be useful in you know, chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, but outside of chemotherapy, it can also become a fuel for cancer. It can also become a fuel for glutamate. So you just want to give people enough. It's conditionally essential, meaning you can't make enough of it when you're under stress. So just a little bit, a gram of glutamine, not 20 grams. You know, it, it's, well, the question is, is mucuna better in oil? And it's actually a water-soluble component. You'll find that it dissolves really readily in water. Um, it, it's also very absorbable, as far as I can tell. It seems to work really well. I did have somebody using it, like kind of making like oil wafers, but uh, I didn't see any change when they went to just straight water extract. Adap What's that? It is the best form of cysteine, naturally occurring cysteine. And you know, you can get a goat. You could use, you could use a goat uh, form, a goat whey, like an organic, free-range goat whey protein is probably the best source of cysteine there is. So a constitutional formula, adaptogens, omega threes, lots of fish oil. Somebody just came up here and said, hey, I had, I had a concussion recently, what should I do? And one of the things I said to do was to take 10 grams of EPA DHA every day for the next four to six weeks. So a hypericum-based formula for helping serotonin activity, for Tom's depression, curcumin. He had a TGF beta elevation that we found through his Lyme work a granule formula to address his constitution. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very warming and invigorating formula. A lot of anabolic support in there. 
an adaptogenic tonic, a tonic with tribulus terrestris, which is one of my favorite herbs we're going to talk about for DHEA because it contains a precursor to DHEA, protodiacin, and I'll show you that on a slide up here. An oral formula of CBD to calm his nerves, helps with his depression, also reduces tremor in PD. Lithium orotate. I love lithium orotate for depression and for, for really for anxiety and for you know mood swings, for mania. It's just wonderfully stabilizing. You know, the dose of lithium carbonate that psychiatrists prescribe is about 1,800 milligrams, 2 grams. This is 20 milligrams. Hans Nieper's work, orotic acid, makes it much more available, and it's just a really nice addition. Acetyl L-carnitine for fat, fatty acid transfer for mitochondrial function, magnesium malate, and a little B12. You know, B12 is one of those things that we have a hard time manufacturing, intrinsic factor hydrochloric acid as we age. So nice thing to get into the protocol. These were some, th these things, so one of the places I started looking was a guy named Marty Hins, a medical doctor from Minnesota. My parents are actually here from Minnesota. Hey, hi Minnesota people. Hey, this is my mom and dad. This is the first time they've ever come to see me uh, give a talk before. They flew in. <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's funny, Marty, Marty Hins, he's a, you know, he started this whole thing. So he basically looks at the neurotransmitter output of your urine and analyzes it and decides how to dose you with mucuna and other things based on that. And I think he's on to some really cool stuff. I've had a lot of uh, other doctor friends work through him and try to do his, his program, but it's pretty intensive. And it's, I think it's not quite where it needs to be yet. He's not using plants, aside from mucuna. He's using a 40% mucuna extract. I'm finding I'm getting amazing results with some of the same kind of concepts, but not in this way of analyzing the neurotransmitters, which is a long story. Folic acid, selenium, 5-HTP, N-acetylcysteine. And N-acetylcysteine is in there because I want to make sure that whatever that dopaminergic uh, neuron degeneration that's occurring is being protected against. So, so we know that cysteine specifically helps to build glutathione, will cross the blood-brain barrier, and will help to prevent those free radicals from damaging the neurons. So even if I'm giving mucuna, and I don't understand, you know, I, I think that the plant's gonna pretty much protect us, but I wanna make sure, because I know that dopamine is, you know, the neurons are breaking down, and he has other mold toxicities and other things happening. So, you know, adding things to protect him. And then N-acetyltyrosine, like I said, it's a little tricky when you gotta watch people when you do this. And he's doing really well with that. It gives him some more energy. For depression, hypericum and N-acetyltyrosine. Wonderful combination. Hypericum, 900 milligrams a day of a you know, nice extract with like 1% hyperforin, hyper, hypericin. And tyrosine, you know, 300 milligrams. Really nice for a lot of people. Sample dose for starting mucuna escal escalation, 300 milligrams four times a day, increasing by 150 milligram increments. Just made me think of a, another guy, Paul, who's a musician that came to me at about 73 years old, couldn't play anymore, a saxophone player, was diagnosed with Parkinson's and was leery of going on to the levodopa therapy because he had heard about the downstream effects. I got him started on a protocol. He's been traveling around the world playing sax like he used to, playing his oboe, and he's just doing this Mukuna protocol. It's really cool. It's amazing when you can help people to that degree, and I'm not... This is just many, many years of me working with this plant and seeing many, many patients and being really amazed by the results and finally getting turned on to the fact that what I know inside of me, and I'm always preaching, that you go with the whole plant is the key. And now I'm just passing it on to you guys so you don't have to experiment. You can just go right to the whole plant. Titrating the doses of mucuna while de-escalating synthetic levodopa and carbidopa. Really important. And you can do it. It just takes time. And you work with the patient, weekly check-ins, see how their symptoms are going, see how things are happening. Levodopa is coming down, their mucuna is going up. You can do it. So I've mentioned some things that are specific. Corey Dallas, which I'll talk about on Sunday in pain and inflammation, is also really good as a nerve and spasticity calming therapy. It alleviates pain and it's breaking up stagnant blood. And with concussions and TBIs and brain injuries, there's blood stagnation. There are areas of damage in the brain, and beta amyloid would just be a kind of blood stagnation if we looked at it from going from the traditional idea to today. 
stagnant material in the tissues. That's what it is. So you want to use herbs that move the blood, break up stagnation, and create flow. Pain is a result of blocked energy in Chinese medicine. Any pain is just when energy, blood, fluids can't flow through an area, the body says, hey, there's a problem. What's not flowing through here? I want to let you know. Hurts. That's what it's telling us. So this herb is really nice for spasms. It's really great to combine with other herbs in formula. And I just kind of gave you some ideas there. Bulk herb, 30 grams a day. Has a lot of tetrahydropalmatine in it, which is an opioid receptor affecting compound. But it's, again, in the whole plant, it doesn't have any kind of weird opioid stuff. It just has a nice analgesia. 30 grams per day of the bulk herb is upper end of dose. Granules, 6 grams. Hyoscyamus niger, the deadly henbane. Do you guys know this plant? It's a narrow therapeutic index plant, right? It's, a, it's an anticholinergic. So it's, it basically slows the cholinergic activity, and it works in that acetylcholine realm that we were talking about doesn't get addressed. So if people don't have well-managed cholinergic symptoms, this plant can be really helpful for calming the tremor. The dosing of it is very specific. You use a low potency, like a 1 to 10, and you dose it in drop dose. You start with 5, 3 times a day, go to 10, go to 15, go to 20, and build it up and see where that person's tolerance is. What do you get with anticholinergics if you get too much, if you're out of that therapeutic index? You start to get dry eyes, dry throat, mouth, dilated pupils, and that's when you know you've gone too far and you need to pull the dosage back. It's a very um, short-acting medication. All those anticholinergic herbs are short-acting, so you don't have to worry about it. If you'll, you'll only build up toxicity if you dose it frequently. And dosing it frequently is really important for controlling tremors, you know, three or four times a day. Kava, another one. The kava lactones are very good for many different conditions. Starting with small doses, combine it with nervines and adaptogens. And when you use it in a formula, it's really effective. I use it in a lot of my nervines, a lot of stuff to calm down anxiety, anxiolytic. It's a very good anxiolytic for spasms, for twitching, for all that kind of stuff. Kava is just really calming. And the kava lactones have like a very GABA-like effect. Um, and also you can see there that for anti-anxiety drugs, when people are trying to get off of them, kava is a real powerful one. Some people react a little stronger to it than others, but most people do really well with it. But I don't normally give it as a single. I normally give it in a formula, 10 to 20%. Phytoestrogens, that's a funny word. Um, it just means that compounds that, that kind of have that estrogenic activity, you know how I said estro estrogen is a signal to the cells to tell them to rebuild? Well, these plants give that signal to the cells to rebuild. So they're called phytoestrogens. It's become a big problem in cancer because they have people go, oh, they're phytoestrogens, they're going to stimulate the estrogen receptor. That means they're going to promote cancer. No, the actual the research in humans shows that that's not true. They actually reduce cancer. They actually enhance the outcomes of women who have breast cancer who have been treated over long periods of time in 10 to 20,000 person studies in Finland and Sweden. So they're very useful in menopause, but they also have a really nice calming effect. When the body doesn't have enough of that yin material, enough of that estrogen, it starts to get more twitchy and trembly. It's like things are dry and friable. Think of estrogen as more moistening and nourishing. It keeps things wet and soft and supple. So when there's not enough of it, we start to get the other effects, that, that windiness, that instability. So these are really good plants to help. Isoflavones have a really good effect on the dopaminergic system. And that's isoflavones, you know, even from soy, diazine and genistein. I like fermented soy for some people. I don't really do soy otherwise. Peony. This is the church, or, or sorry, bai shao, the white peony. Really nice spasmolytic does a really good job of inhibiting spasms, um, has some anti-epileptic activity, two main compounds, PNL and pianoflorin. They cross the brain, inhibit neuro neurological damage, and in a bulk decoction of herbs, 9 to 18 grams a day, you can go bigger than that, and you combine it with licorice, and the two of them combined one-to-one, -one, peony and licorice, is a classic remedy for spasm, for twitch, for the Parkinson-like symptoms. Licorice also supports the HPA axis, converts cortisol to cortisone, so it helps make that cortisol into a steroid that you know controls the fires, helps restore DHEA, and it's it's really its role in Chinese medicine forever has been enhancing the actions of other herbs, marrying a formula, and preventing toxicities from herbs that are mildly toxic or 
need to be mediated. That's what licorice does a great job of that. It's also really good. It's a chi tonic. It's a tonifying herb. And remember I said these Parkinson's people are all deficient. We need to tonify them. All these different things it does. Protects the thymus and adrenal glands. Supports adrenal response. 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. This is how we convert cortisol. This is how you break it down. And so it prevents that. Glyceri glycerizic acid, which converts into glyceretic acid and inhibits this enzyme supports the amount of cortisol that's available and cortisone in the body. So it helps support the adrenals in that way. So let's go into the botanical section and really hit it hard for the next you know, 45 minutes. So the first category here, adaptogens, with also anabolic and anti-catabolic actions. That's what we talked about. We want to build that anabolic activity, moderate the stress response, tonify the essence. There are some plants that actually can help to supply some essence to the body. CNS calming agents, calm the nervous system. Don't let people be anxious. Antidepressants, talked a lot about hypericum. There are others. Enhance cognition, enhance mitochondrial function, protect the nerves, and improve cerebral blood flow. If we can do all these things, we're going to do some great work with our patients. So here's our adaptogenic agents. Repunticum, Mumi, that's the Russian chilajit, rhodiola. The deer antler, pantocrine, that's taken from the deer antlers when they have velvet in the spring. There's a sustainable harvest in Russia. It's not the nicest thing to do to deer, but we do a lot worse things to people and other animals. Panax ginseng, ashwagandha, and eleuthero. So let's talk about repunticum. This is an herb that lots of us don't really know about, but ever since I started working with Donnie 15 years ago, I realized the value in this plant. It's the, really the strongest botanical anabolic medicine that we know of. It's a very rich source of what are called phytoectosteroids. There's a number of them, luzeasterone, turkesterone, ectosterone, ectosone. They're all really helpful for, again, if you imagine testosterone affects the testosterone receptors and sends a signal to the nucleus to make more proteins, that's a very strong response. Cells have receptors for testosterone. These molecules, these anabolic enhancing molecules, can actually do some of that. They actually give that response. They induce some transcription to that DNA to replicate the cell. It's just that it's not as strong as testosterone. It doesn't compete with testosterone. There's other compounds in these plants, too, that also do a really nice job of supporting the efficiency of the hormones, you know, connecting that receptor network. It's that matrix effect of all the plant compounds. About 5% um, ectosterones is a really good kind of standardization for repunticum. It's an adaptogen. It's anti-fatigue. It's anabolic. Protects the cardiovascular and cerebral networks. It was originally discovered by the people in the Marl region of Russia, and they, they watched the Marl deer would dig up this root. And they discovered it, you know, I don't know, 1,500 years ago, and they realized over time what it was good for. And they realized that with the deer, it was something that, like, strengthened their bodies. It made their hides thicker and strengthened their, you know, their hooves and their horns. And they started using it for people that had ataxias that were just debilitated and had just really couldn't thrive. And Rapunzel started to give them strength over time. That's what it started to use as a folk medicine. And then in that big exploration by the Russians into adaptogens as they were trying to find a way to help people adapt to stress over time, Repunticum became a really powerful agent for them because they looked at cocaine, they looked at amphetamines, they looked at you know methylphenidate, all those things, and they just saw that with anything that you try to give people that's a stimulant, there's a crash. It just doesn't work. It just gives them energy for a little while, then they get they just wipe out. So they wanted to find something that worked differently. So Eleutherococcus and Rhodiola and Shizandra, ginseng, Repunticum, these were all things that they studied extensively. Sexual enhancement, back to that area, enhancing the reproductive capacity, enhancing the essence. It decreases platelet aggregation, aggregation. Lots of lots of beneficial effects. So this one, Mumi, Russian mountain rock juice. This is the stuff that literally bubbles out of the mountains in the high areas of Nepal and Tibet, up above you know six thousand meters. Is that right? No, three thousand meters. Sorry, three thousand meters, where it will form as like a black tar that is harvested. And it's rich in fulvic and humic acids and all kinds of nutrients and compounds that we don't even, we haven't identified yet. And it was used similarly as, as kind of a, an anti-ataxic for people that were debilitated by the traditional people. And as we examined it, we found, wow, this stuff is extremely anabolic. Lots of studies showing bone density increases, has a very adaptogenic effect overall, accelerates protein and mineral metabolism, 
increases lean muscle mass. That's one of the things that Rapunticum does. Combining these two together helps people build muscle, reduce adipocytes, change body composition. Of course, you've got to combine it with exercise. You know, your body won't do it if you don't ask it to do it. Eleutherococcus centicosis. This was the chief adaptogen studied by the, the Russian people I described. And this herb is neutral. It's also a Chinese herb. It's the kind of chief adaptogen because it does a really great job of just helping our bodies adapt to stress without causing side effects. It's neutral in nature, so there's no nobody gets hot flashed or anything. Like the, some, some people with ginseng get too heat, heated up from it. It does a really nice job. Rhodiola rosea, another really important adaptogen, improves learning and memory specifically. And again, remember, on most of these studies, aside from the long like observational studies done in, in Russia on these herbs, most of it's coming from animals and some human studies. But look at all the things that rhodiola does. Enhances CNS activity, improves learning and memory, inhibits aging of the brain, increases capacity for exercise. It's a neuro enhancer. It's a really powerful plant. People think of it as kind of like, oh, it's too stimulating. I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen it stimulate many people in practice or in my own experience. I find it to be a really nice adaptogen. Here's pandocrine, the deer antler. Look at what's in here. Collagen, amino acids, essential fatty acids, phospholipids, parts of cell membranes, minerals, trace minerals, functional pro proteins. It raises human growth hormone. So now we're into this idea, instead of giving people human growth hormone or giving them testosterone, we're giving them rapunticum, we're giving them mumi, we're giving them pantocrine, we're giving them rhodiola. These are things that they can take over the long term. And in these observational studies done on adaptogens in Russia, there are five and 10 year long studies of hundreds and hundreds of people taking, you know, one group does adaptogen every day, one group doesn't. They're in a factory, they're in a school, whatever they're doing. And they find that the benefits are increasing over time. You can take these herbs daily for long periods of time. Panax ginseng, one of my all-time favorite herbs. And of course, it's gotten a lot of you know, press and uh, focus as kind of a Taoist herb, which it is. It has this effect in Chinese medicine to tonify the source qi, which in the scholarly level, that's where the essence becomes tangible something, where that, that place where essence becomes. That's where ginseng targets, and it's the only plant that does that, that we know of. It's rich in a group of saponins called ginsenicides, and it has a lot of them. You know, Panax Noto ginseng has a lot of ginsenicides, and it also, Luther, uh, American ginseng has a lot of ginsenicides, and they are wonderful regulators of our stress response. They, you know, they, they spare the adrenal atrophy that happens over time when we kind of have a long stressful demand of a lot of cortisol output. It'll help to, you know, support the adrenals in that way. It does a great job of building energy over the long period. You know, in Chinese medicine, it, you know, most people over 35 were considered you know, they should be taking some ginseng. That was kind of like a Taoist sort of kung fu idea. It would just support you because, as we find out now, DHEA and testosterone levels start to fall at age 35. We peak at 35, and beyond that, we start losing it. So when you take ginseng and these other plants I'm talking about, we can start to stabilize that DHEA level over time and make not have that steep decline that we see with most people when we age in an unhealthy environment. Improving mental performance helps with poor concentration. Neurotrophic helps to rebuild the nerves. Neuroprotective. Again, these are the long-term solutions that we put in place that are addressing the root, not the branch. Okay, we still got to treat the branch. You got a patient who has severe symptoms. Still got to control those symptoms somehow. But if you're just giving a mucuna, I don't know that we're giving them all this support. If you give all the support and the mucuna, now we're treating the branch and the root. So many good things. Improves learning capacity. Impro increases the number of dividing cells in the hippocampus. Prevents beta amyloid plaque. Check out these studies when you get a chance. Just a bunch of studies on, on the effects of panax ginseng specifically in these areas. Neuroprotection. American ginseng. The key thing with this one, also rich in ginsenicides like, like ginseng, but it's less stimulating and heating than Panax ginseng. Better for younger people. Good for women and having hot flashes and things where they, they can't take the ginseng because of the warming effect. Neurological protectants, improves memory and learning, improves ADHD, incre increases cerebral circulation. And this one's really, you know, I think we all are pretty familiar with this. It seems like 
ashwagandha is one of those limelight herbs that's kind of stayed in this place of favor among herbalists and, and just you know, consumers alike. It's been shown to inhibit dementia and AD specifically, enhancing learning and memory, slows the aging process. It's, an, uh, it's a rasayana, kind of like the equivalent of an adaptogen in Ayurveda. It's neutral, so it doesn't have that heating effect or cooling effect. Builds essence. Very few things do that. It's anxiolytic and antidepressant, rich in withanolides. Sure. Yes. Great. No problem. No problem? Nope. She's wondering if there's a problem combining thyroid medication with ashwagandha. And like with any thyroid medication, you don't take it at the same time. You take your thyroid medication separate because it's got a lot of interference with other things. But doing ashwagandha, I mean, I think if you push the dosage up with any herb, you can get into problems. But ashwagandha as a part of a formula, hundreds of patients have combined them with thyroid and ashwagandha. I'd say 20% of a formula. And a, and a formula, I mean, you know, 10 milliliters a day. 10 milliliters, 10 milliliters a day of like a standard one to two menstruum ratio ashwagandha extract inside of a formula, 20%. I don't think you're gonna have a problem with any drugs. And I can say that with, you know, incredible confidence. Shazandra, the five favorite flavor fruit. This is a, this is a good example of a sour flavor that actually holds essence. Its whole like ancient concept was that it would prevent the leakage of essence from your body. We're always losing it, right, throughout life, but to hold on to it. Rather than try to put more in, hold what you have. That's what Shizandra does in this context. It's got the tannins and the lignans, and the lignans, which are the Shizandrins, have been shown in research to do a lot of really beneficial things. Everything from very hepatoprotective, tons of liver support and detox support, to support in adrenal function to normalizing the HPA axis. And the seed has some really great qualities. So it's nice to have the whole seed and the fruit together. So this, is, this herb I mentioned earlier, and I really like it, Tribulus terrestris, another one, Bai Ji Li in Chinese medicine. Uh, we learned it as it frees the liver energy. That's kind of how it was described in Chinese medicine. It, it, modern research has shown that it's rich in protodiacin. Protodiacin is a precursor to DHEA, which of course is a precursor to testosterone and growth hormone. It's been shown to help with impotence, low libido, and male infertility, quenches free radicals, helps the kidney detoxify, and stimulates the flow of bile, the breakdown of fats in the liver. Tribulus is a very nice supportive herb that's not strong. It's not gonna like, you know, induce any kind of effects in people. I've never seen it like really over stimulate somebody. It's just a really nice, gentle way to address the problem of DHA deficiency without giving people DHA oral. And I think if we wanted to get into something where we started to say, well, let's try five milligrams of DHA in a very deficient patient, and let's combine it with ginseng and tribulus and a few other things, I think we could do really well. And then you'd also want to combine some, some nutrients and herbs to help with the metabolism pathways. You know, we sulfate, we methylate, we glycosylate, we have glutathione, we conjugate. So if you support all those with sulfation agents and methylation agents, you can improve the outcomes of what those downstream metabolites are gonna be with people. And the best way is if you can do a hormone panel, look at their estrogen metabolites. Look at, look, I, I like, there's a test called the Dutch kit. I love that test. It's a four sample, 24 hour dried urine, look at hormone metabolites. Very, very helpful test. 150 bucks out of pocket for the reproductive, 250 for the full adrenal and the organic acids. Really helps to see what are the byproducts, what are the downstream products that the body's making. So if you're making a whole bunch of dihydrotestosterone, but all you looked at was testosterone and you saw testosterone was low, you just give someone testosterone. Well, then you just made more dihydrotestosterone because that's where it's all going. You want to know that stuff. Cordyceps. This is the winter worm summer herb. Another one of our mushrooms. Mushrooms are so important. And there's been some great research, even on button mushrooms, even on like your, your basic white mushrooms, cremini mushrooms. They have shown already to be very supportive in neurological conditions. This herb is very specific as a tonic for the kidney and the lung, and it gets to that kidney level. This is a, an, a fungus that actually grows out of the retina of a caterpillar. Very interesting relationship between those two, but that's 
the magic of it. It's like this special blend. And then we get the, when you get the wild cordyceps, it's full of compounds that are so helpful. I'm going to just jump over here into the essence side of things. Specific herbs to tonify essence. Romania. This is a root that grows underground. It's under the dirt. A lot of the roots that are medicines that grow under the ground are very nourishing. A lot of the aerial parts and things that are up high are more clearing, venting. It's these simple sort of doctrine of signatures type of concepts that do hold in many cases. Tianmen Dong, the wild asparagus, very moistening, very nourishing to the kidney, very moistening to the whole system. Hu Shu Wu, Polygonum multiflorum, another one of my top favorite herbs, is an herb that's generally thought of as an herb you could take every day the rest of your life and prevent aging. Fo Ti. It's a great herb. It's kind of a Taoist remedy. The coolest thing, and we'll go into this in a minute here, is that not only is it doing all these things that are known in traditional Chinese medicine, like being an elixir of life, building the sexual energy and, and the energy in the body, reducing signs of aging, improving the blood and the hair, but it's also been shown now in modern research to do all these cool things, improving learning, inhibiting age-related mental decline, prevents AD and PD specifically, regulates cell apoptosis, detoxifies neurotoxins, acetylcholinesterase, it goes right into that area and has an impact on that problem in Parkinson's disease. Lipid modulating, age reducing effects. So when you take the, the plant and now you start, you know, again, you went from this sort of broad view of like how it's an essence tonic and it supports the body by preventing aging and helping in so many ways. And then you come to this point where you start saying, well, what's in it? There's this stuff, tetrahydroxy still being glucosides. And these have been tied to being calcium channel antagonists which is important. Remember I said that excitation is this influx of calcium ions that charges up the, the neuron and makes it go excited. So this helps. Magnesium helps too. Prevents the learning memory deficit in 80-like models, specifically in Alzheimer's disease. Reverses the learning memory deficit in the late stage of 80-like disorders. I, I would bet you if we had the money to run this just this plant, side by side, with any drug the pharmaceutical industry could throw at us, we would see better results in Alzheimer's disease. Anybody got a few billion? <laughs> Here's some studies supporting what I'm saying, just so you have the, the data. The data is there. One thing about essence tonics, they're a little bit cloying. They're enriching. They have this material, so you have to help them by making the body digest them easier. So you use things that are damp transforming, promoting the circulation of blood, counter that cloying nature. It's a principle in Chinese medicine. So when you, when you take Hu Shu Wu as a whole herb and you cook it in a decoction, you combine it with citrus peel and fermented soybeans. And that's the classic way to do it where you're going to get full absorption. So we want to calm the central nervous system. Passion flower. Love this stuff. Antispasmodic. So this is kind of part of building an anxiolytic formula for somebody. You want to calm their nervous system down. Passion flower. This plant is just so magical. I just love it. It's sort of like it has all this deep spiritual stuff going on with it. American skullcap. This is from, this is from um, one of my favorite herbalists, Finley Ellingwood on the turn of the century, eclectic physician. Back in those days, herbs were medicine. There was no, you know, it wasn't like, there's medicine and then there's these herbs over here. It was like, no, we just use herbs and they just would create all kinds of extracts and things. Check it out. While there's where there's irritability of the nervous system with restlessness and nervous excitability, inability to sleep without pain, general irritability with insomnia from local physical causes, it's indicated. Also, nervous disorder, twitching, muscular action, muscle action, tremors and restlessness, all these places, this herb has been shown to do wonders for his patients and for many of the patients at that time. All these physicians were, you know, 1919, he published that book, right? He already been practicing for 40 years. This is, this is what they did. So some of the stuff going on, Bicolin and Bicolin in American Skullcap, specifically GABA receptor, anxiolytic activity, randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study, enhanced global mood without a reduction in energy or cognition. 
I love that kind of stuff. When they can actually show that herbs are pleiotropic, that they actually have multiple effects, that they can support your neurological function while they calm you down. That's the difference between a plant medicine and a single molecule, single target approach. Robert Steve. How, how do I decide how to make a formula out of these? And I will tell you, I will start with the fact that passion flower is going to be a base for me. Most people do really well with it. It helps calm them down, helps them sleep. It's very relaxing, not, not a side effect herb. It would depend. I mean, I would just say that it would be a bulk. It would probably be 20, 20 to 30 percent of most formulas. Skull cap, this is going to be based again. It's really good for calming down the nervous system, but it's also really good, like I said, in muscle spasmy type of stuff, and twitching and like uncoordination. So 20% in, in those kind of cases, it could be more like 15% if it just was someone who had nervous energy, anxiety, and insomnia. Avena, this is a kind of a gentle nerve tonic. I would say I like to do like 10%. Again, it is oats, so there is avena in there. So if people are super sensitive to gliadin type of stuff, I would stay away from it. Zisiphus. For blood deficiency type of patients that need to nourish a little bit of blood, calm the heart, 10 to 15 percent. Lavender, 5 to 10 percent. Melissa, 5 to 10 percent. And then kava, anywhere from 5 to 20 percent, depending. And I would adjust those doses based on what I was trying to target. Thanks, Robert. So here's Zisiphus. This is a, 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 an herb that nourishes the yin and the blood of the heart and the liver. So again, it's a tonic, but it tonifies without stimulating. It calms the spirit. Shen disturbance, disturbance of the spirit. That's the concept. When the blood is deficient, the spirit wanders. That's the idea. So this herb does a nice job of helping, helping the ground the spirit in the blood and to nourish the blood gently. What has it been? Some modern research on Sisyphus. 295 volunteers, aided restful sleep, reduced fatigue. Both reduce fatigue and help them sleep. A lot of people need tonics at bedtime. You need stuff to work with. You need energy to work with while you're sleeping and your body's rebuilding itself. It's important. It's hard to, you, you just got, you got to, this is a deeper understanding of like being a physician, but that's something I do a lot with people is tonify them at night. Zisiphus seed extract, sedated activity, cause sedative activity, and hypnotic activity when administered orally to mice. So it has that sedative quality. And relaxation. Albizia julebrisin. This one could be a high dose herb if you do it as a single, but I use it in a lot of formulas. You know, I'll combine it with other herbs. You can use it in a tincture. Like you could do hypericum with albizia. This is very uplifting. It's very joyful and happy. Look at these flowers. They grow all over Ashland where I live. They look like it's a celebration happening, you know? Enhances all aspects of neurotransmitter secretion and regulation. That's a quote. Antidepressant, anti-anxiolytic. So it reduces anxiety and then also lifts you up from depression. Pleiotropic effects of plants. This can be dosed very nicely. There's, no, there's really very little side effect from this at all. The bark or the flowers. Bacopa moniri, another Rasayana from, from Ayurvedic medicine, Really powerful, these bacopicides. They're another kind of saponin, like the ginsenicides. These guys increase GABA, and they improve cholinergic function, calm the brain, increases concentration, and really facilitates memory. I didn't experiment with this plant for a while. There was a capsulated version I got from a company a while back, and I started taking you know, three at a time, four at a time, four every hour. And I would tell you, I could remember things on that plant that I couldn't remember otherwise, like just distant stuff that would connect. It was almost like the paths in the deep forest of my memory started to get clear from that plant. And that's just my own experience, but I've been able to see that with people. And if you take it into the children, it's very good for ADHD, ADD, great for autism and just focusing people. Works really well, but it's also extremely protective. This is one of those herbs that will get those heavy metals out of people, like what Robert was talking about. You know, if you find that they have heavy metals, bacopa is going to be really good for getting rid of aluminum and so the other things that are hard to get rid of. I did, at some point in my dosing, I did get some gurgly, digestive-y kind of stuff. So, 
you know, again, as a single herb, you can't go too high, you'll get problems, so you combine it in a formula. Hypericum, I love this plant. It's got such a bad rap as this, you know, the poster child for drug and herb interactions, you know? And it's, man, it's, it's unfortunate because what it is, is it's, it's the most effective, like, detoxification multitasker I've ever seen. This pregnane X receptor, it's like the oversight committee for which metabolic pathway a toxin is going to go through. It's amazing what it does to, for all hepatic detoxification. It's considered an alternative, you know, and we think of this, the, it, the way that it induces enzyme activity. So the, the big place that it's always getting in trouble was the CYP3A4 pathway, right? Which is the main pathway, cytochrome P4, sorry, P453A4. That pathway is where most drugs are metabolized by the body and broken down into their metabolites. What St. John's wort does is it increases the activity of that enzyme and others. It induces them. What does it do? It gets rid of toxins. What does that tell us? The drugs are toxic. That's what it's saying. Where does it grow? Where the roads have been cut through the forest? It grows up all around them. It's like healing the neurological network of the roads, it's, I mean, the forest. It's a serotonin modulator. There's all this kind of, there was some data that came out around it being a ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's not a drug. It's not a reuptake inhibitor, but it does influence serotonin reception, serotonin manufacture, serotonin efficiency. Very effective for depression. Very effective to protect the nervous system. And for people like, like for pain around nerves, like for post-herpetic neuralgia, a teaspoon a day, or I'm sorry, a teaspoon three times a day, I've done in many patients to help those nerves heal. It's a neurological repair herb par excellence. It's the best one I know of. Rosemary, the herb of remembrance, carnosic acid, which breaks down to carnosol to quench free radicals. <laughs> Normalizes cell behavior, quenches free radicals, regenerates neurons. When I use it in a formula, it's a small percentage, you know? So it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, but I really like it a lot. Anti-mutagenic. Curcumin, you know, you could talk about this plant forever because there was so much focus on it, you know, MD Anderson, Barrett Agarwal, all this research on curcumin, it was such a limelight herb for so long, but it's just one of so many herbs. It's from a class of herbs in Chinese medicine that has 20 some herbs in it called herbs that promote blood circulation. And all of them kick butt. And just because curcumin has been studied so much doesn't mean it's better. It's just that, you know, it, it, it's got a long history of use, it's very safe, and it's effective. Removes heavy metals from the brain. And this stuff, you know, I again am back to that idea because all the products came out around curcuminoids and, you know, how much curcumin can I get in? Well, curcuminoids are just part of turmeric. So I use turmeric now. I use turmeric powder and I combine it with oil and black pepper. And that's how I get the best effects with turmeric in people. Green tea is outstanding, you guys, in neurological disorders. Go to China, you sit down for dinner, bam, there's a pot of green tea right there. Everybody's just drinking green tea. It's rich in L-theanine and the catechins, the catechins, epigallocatechin gallate. That compound has so much data on it. Sharper minds in elders, inhibits Alzheimer's disease, inhibits NF-kappa beta, reduces oxidative damage, detoxes heavy metals, enhances oxygen uptake. It does everything. I, after I did this, I, I, I know, I've known this stuff forever, but like after I seriously like spent like 50 hours putting together this presentation, I was like, I'm just drinking green tea now all the time. I'm not drinking black tea anymore. I'm like, I'm back to green tea. I, I forgot how awesome it is. Look at these studies, human studies. Case control studies in Japan, two or more cups a day, reduced cognitive impairment, decreased Parkinson's disease, 30,000 people in Finland, three or more cups a day, 50,000 men and 80,000 women in China, 40% lower Parkinson's risk. 20% lower Parkinson's risk reported three cups a day for 10 years. Green tea, guys. It's awesome. And look at the things that are really popular. I would say like something's cliche because it's awesome. That's why it's a cliche. Because enough people said, wow, that's true. Curcumin, enough people said that's true. Green tea, enough people said that's true. There's a lot of things like that. And just because they're popular doesn't mean they don't work. It just means they're part of the picture. They're a good tool for us. Just a couple of, couple of green tea references. Grape seed and skin, like I said, resveratrol, that's still bean, the phytoalexin produced by the plants to protect themselves from fungi that has incredible activities in our body. 
inhibit brain aging, improve cognitive function. Even grape juice has been shown to improve cognitive function, which is too much sugar, but resveratrol itself, here's some of the plants that resveratrol is in, and also pterostilbene, another phytoalexin, a stilbene that has this incredible quenching capacity in the body to quench the free radicals. But look what else it does. Well, actually, I no, that's not in this slide. It does a ton of other great things. This isn't quite as clear as I wanted to, but all these studies are human studies on resveratrol and neurocognitive health. Every one of them shows benefit with resveratrol. This drug right here, this, this, this compound, again, combine it with the plant. Give it with grape seed and skin extract. Give it with polygonum multiflorum extract. Don't just give it as resveratrol as an isolate. But if you want to increase the resveratrol, I, use, I buy it by kilograms, and I give it to my patients in addition to the herbs. So they get both that matrix effect happening. All these studies show benefit. There's their dose, 75 milligrams to 2,000 milligrams a day. There was a bunch of weird research that came out that kind of started talking about resveratrol potentially being a, um, a problematic at high doses for cardiovascular health. I, it's not, never really come to light. I don't think it's a problem. Again, combine it with plants. And probably a, a gram a day is a really good dose for folks that you want to you know, help them out. Ginkgo, this is a brain herb. We know that. It increases blood flow to the brain, suppresses amyloid beta toxicity, combine it with rosemary and salvia miltioriza. This is, and salvia is one of those herbs I've been asked earlier today about the NRF2 agonists. And NRF2 is the enzyme that induces the body to build glutathione, to take the glutamine, the glycine, and the cysteine and put them together. So salvia miltioriza was one of those plants. Also schizandra, also milk thistle. The ginkolides are very neuroprotective. And there was some studies done comparing ginkgo to tacrin and donepezil. No side effects and similar benefits in cognitive, <coughs> cognitive performance. And it's going to help. Like you, can't, you don't stop the herb and then suddenly fall to where you were before. It actually does things to help. So how do you increase the cerebral blood flow? Well, vinpocetine is a semi-synthetic from the vinca plant, vinca alkaloids. This semi-synthetic at 5 to 10 milligrams per day is really good for hearing, for blood flow to the brain, for cerebellar problems like dizziness and imbalance. People who have, who come in, they're like losing their balance, not sure why, cerebellum issues. It can be very helpful there. It's been shown to increase blood flow to the brain, vinpocetine. I combine here arginine and citrulline. Citrulline is a precursor to arginine. Arginine is the building block for nitric oxide in the body. Nitric oxide is how we vasodilate. It's how we open up the blood vessels. So you want to get blood flow, open the blood vessels, and blood will flow there. Three to six grams per day. It's a really good dose. Again, combine it with the herbs. Combine it with all those herbs we talked about, with ginkgo, with bacopa. Have a formula that has the adaptogens in it. If they need to calm down, give them those DNS calming herbs. If they need to build their move, give them the hypericum, the tyrosine, give them all the, 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 the albizia. You know, these are all, you can put these things together and help people so much. Notoginseng relieves blood stagnation, promotes the circulation of blood, great for you know, oxygenating the brain. There's that salvia miltioriza again, Don Shen, very good for moving blood and getting, you know, reducing inflammation and kind of helping the body to get blood to key areas. Saffron, what an amazing oxygenator that is. It's an oxygenator, it helps the thyroid, helps the brain. It's so powerful. I don't know if you know, but saffron is coveted around the world. I mean, it's one of the most expensive herbs there are. A lot of the people that were growing opiate, opium for the opium industry, as that got to the point where there were regulations in place, they shifted to saffron. And they're making a great living growing saffron. I mentioned mushrooms, but I just want to show, there's reishi. We have an Oregon reishi up north that was discovered recently that I found in the woods that's really powerful. And these, are, these, these guys normally are digesting wood. What they do in nature is they clarify things. And what they do in our bodies is they clarify things. When, when we have turbidity in the body in Chinese medicine, it's called dampness. It's also called phlegm. Mushrooms are really good at getting rid of turbidity. Mushrooms are really good in the eco. If you put a mushroom in an environment, it soaks up all the toxins. It does that in our bodies, too. It'll help in so many ways to modify the response of the immune system, reduce those toxic Compounds, tonify the body, and cleanse the body. Cordyceps is a tonifier. Reishi is also a tonifier. But they also clear at the same time. They're very beneficial. And they, they got a bad rap. Some people are like, oh, mushrooms are going to cause your liver enzymes to elevate. You know what, guys? Anything can cause a certain person's enzymes to, liver enzymes to elevate. Green tea does it to some people. You know, like, 
one oncologist has a bad experience with a person who took mushroom extracts, and suddenly everybody, everybody mushroom extracts cause liver enzyme elevations. Terrible. Coriococcus, another, this is another mushroom that has just a really great effect. So, so much focus on the gut, right, and on that part of our bodies. And what it does is it drains away dampness, that turbidity, and tonifies the spleen gently. And you can take it over long periods of time. There's no side effects. It's very gentle. It's bland in nature. And it just helps digestion. Fish oil. I just mentioned to the, the young man here who had just had a concussion, and I said 10 grams a day of fish oil, high EPA DHA, for the next four, four to six weeks after concussion. Some good data supporting that. Can't tell you how important fish oil is and just how, you know, fatty acids in general for the brain. This stuff is just so helpful. So what are the nutrients for neurological health? There's a little list for you. I got them there for you. NADH, right? This is a really good part of the, you know, the, the energy manufacture cycle. A lot of people will do well with that. Like Parkinson's patients are like fatigued and things. I like give them NADH in the morning with some tyrosine and some, you know, in the right, if it's the right person, the right dose, and then hypericum, and you get a really nice lift in their energy. Then they're more able to do stuff, like exercise, to get that anabolic thing going. Glutamine, like I said, watch your dose. Magnesium, a great calcium channel, channel inhibitor. Alpha lipoic acid, We're gonna, I'll hit a couple of these for you right now. Here's a little chart I wanted to give you to have, because this is sort of like my experience with these amino acids and how they help in neurocognitive disorders. Again, glutamine is a lower dose, and you don't do it in bipolar syndromes. That might be the one that you're talking about, bipolar. Glycine, also not in bipolar. Glycine acts as a neurotransmitter. Both of these can be, so that's why the bipolar part, because you don't want to push it one or the other. GABA, which is good for some people, but a lot of people have a hard time getting it into the digestive system and then getting it to work. So you want to use other things that help with GABA, like cam chamomile has apigenin in it, uh, kava, uh, L-theanine, things that stimulate GABA that can be helpful. Glycine, also a good GABA agonist. L-theanine from tea, the focusing and calming part, L-tryptophan for serotonin, and both of these, and then 5-HTP in some people. I try to use L-tryptophan. The only reason that it kind of fell out of favor is because there was that whole, like it was a plant in Japan that had the toxicity issue with tryptophan like 20 years ago, and then everybody said, oh, God, tryptophan's toxic, and then they went to 5-HTP. But most people, it's better to give the, the original substance, the closer to the natural form, let your body do all the, the steps to get it to where it's supposed to go. And then, of course, some people, they, they, they don't do it very well, so you give them the 5-HTP, and it's better. Once in a while, someone has diarrhea from it, but that's pretty rare. And then there's tyrosine for sluggish depression. So some of the things that specifically enhance the, the, the mitochondria, CoQ10, we talked about this at length, carnitine, the fatty acid shuttle, gets the fatty acids moving in the brain. Alpha lipoic acids recycles glutathione. Magnesium, creatine, glutamine. So I wanna talk about this way. So you think about creatine, the main creatine on the market that bodybuilders use is creatine monohydrate. It's renal toxic when you take big doses of it. It's not, it's not good. This is a much better way to get your creatine in. Creatine has magnesium chelate. Albion Labs does a nice one. Neuro Albion, Albion Labs. Supplement three to five milligrams, of, uh, three, three to five grams a day. Significant enhancement in brain energy capacity and improved cognitive performance. Neuroprotective in Huntington's disease. And you can apply a lot of these things, this, this stuff especially to ALS. A lot of these things, those amino acids and these mitochondrial enhancers are going to be very helpful in that disease. Lowers glutamate. And this is mostly creatine, so you don't have to worry about getting too much magnesium. Carnosine and alpha lipoic acid. Carnosine is a really nice job of quenching radicals. It's been used for the eyes a lot because when the, the liver opens into the eyes, right? And so we think about the hepatic detox the eyes are the first place to start to suffer when we don't detox well because it's all this little micro capillaries, micro machinery in the eyes that we start to show it there. That's our liver showing us that we're not denaturing, quenching free radicals. Carnosine is fantastic for that. And both of these inhibit glycosylation, our AGEs, right? Prevent cross-linking of proteins to DNA. And alpha lipoic acid recycles glutathione. It, it's amazing as an indirect antioxidant. Carnitine and acetyl L-carnitine, I'll just say that acetyl L-carnitine moves carnitine into the brain more readily. And this is, again, you know, 500 milligram doses are really good a couple times a day. You could do acetyl L-carnitine with, with these people with uh, 
difficulty with mitochondria in the brain, neuroprotection. And imagine giving people these things over time before they have symptoms, how protective we can be for our patients. We can prevent them. So just, just a vitamin D, I mean, it's clearly associated with neurocognitive decline. Another reason to normalize vitamin D levels. And I don't know if you guys saw, but like, insure, they basically, the, the, what was it? I don't know what organization it was, but just came out and said, that, oh, well, vitamin D data is not that good, so we're not going to pay for vitamin D tests for patients anymore. It's like, oh my God, there's so much data. It's insane. So three yummy things, alcohol, coffee, and chocolate. Well, look at this. A little bit seems to do you some good. A little bit of alcohol, you know, one to two cups. And that's not, I mean, that's not straight ethanol. That's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> coffee, <laughs> coffee, one to three cups, chocolate, two to four ounces. And of course, it's going to be, you know, pure black chocolate, dark chocolate, lots of cacao. Those greater than 55 who have one to two alcohol drinks a day were more than 40% less likely to develop any kind of dementia during an eight-year study. How could that be? Because you know what? In Chinese medicine, I don't know about whiskey. I mean, that's a good question. We didn't. Bam! <laughs> Better with red wine, but yeah, I hear you. <laughs> exactly. People who carry the APOE4 gene may even get more benefit from low amounts. And this goes back to hormesis. It goes back to like mood. It goes back to happiness. It goes back to social consumption. There's so much here beyond just what we think about in chemistry. So here's the references just supporting why these things are good for us in small amounts. And this was really important to me because this is a big study. 36,000 men in Scotland. Direct association between alcohol consumption and cancer mortality risk. Basically, if you drink a moderate or light amount and you exercise at least 150 minutes a, a week, your risk is the same if you didn't do either. That's what they discovered. Almost 40,000 people. I, I was blown away by the study. I was like, exercise, man. God, you can just exercise. Nurses Health study again. One, up to one drink per day does not impair cognitive function and may actually decrease the risk of cognitive decline. Moderate drinkers had better cognitive scores than non-drinkers. You don't know exactly why this is, but it's just, it makes sense. So here's just a, like, a, a quick overview of my approach before everybody runs out of here. I know it's 5.15. Give me one minute. This is the, the thing. Take this list, reduce stress, create wellness, this is a list I thought a lot about, so hopefully you guys can all have it, and just you can just give it to your patients. Just here, it's a resource. And then I said pulsatility, you guys. Do things in cycles. Nothing in nature is static. Change supplement regimens. Bring in fasting. Make dietary cycles. All things are in a constant flux. So my last thought, it's not merely needing to keep our minds active, playing games and doing puzzles. There are toxins, real toxins. Yeah. You don't have this one? You don't have this one either? Yeah. I, I added a couple. You know, it's like you get something, you know, when is it done? I don't know. <laughs> well, not that slide, but yeah. Well, I, I, it's on the online. Oh, it's on the online version. Okay, well, there's my final musings. There are toxins, real toxins, and we need anabolic metabolism, detoxification pathways, supported by anabolic hormone-driven enzyme systems. We have to quench free radicals, control inflammation, moderate stress hormone output, quell our addiction to stimulation, focus on tranquil moments, use plants and nutrients that support our bodies to do the difficult job of clearing the toxins and maintain restorative balance in our bodies. The brain is not an isolated component. It is a central part, and it is intrinsically networked throughout our bodies. That's it. Thank you, guys.